Hi, welcome everybody. How are we doing today? Are we excited to be at WordCamp Antwerp? Yeah. Yes, I like to hear that. First and foremost, I'd like to thank my colleague Brecht, who is uh, taking nice footage of me right now. I, uh, I left uh, Ghent, where I work, yesterday. I came to Antwerp, slept in a hotel, opened my laptop back, saw that everything was there besides my laptop. So he was kindly enough to borrow his stuff. So thank you, Brecht. I hope it doesn't break on me. This talk is called Docker for WordPress Developers. And when I talk about Docker, I obviously do not mean the Dacia Docker. I was uh, standing in front of traffic lights, not that far from me, and I was still in my head preparing my talk, and I saw a Dacia Docker, and it was meant to be. It was meant to be <laughs> like that. But then again, Docker is the container technology we all love to love or hate to hate. Uh, who has heard of Docker? Keep your hands in the air. Who, then, who uses Docker? In production, <laughs> oh, 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 oh. we all agree that it's, it's very hot on the hype scale. And uh, to that extent that I'm every single place I go, it's Docker, 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 Docker. And it will wear out on me. I'm still, it's still a novelty for a lot of people. I'm, I'm still cool with it. But I think looking in the future, three or four years in the future, We'll get sick and tired of the term. But it goes broader than that. The entire container ecosystem has terms like Swarm and Kubernetes and Moby and Rancher and Rocket and CoreOS and etcd and Flannel and Prometheus and Helm. You get the picture, right? It, it's kind of confusing. And this is just only a small, small aspect of the entire uh, container community. And I get it that you're confused. And if you dive deeper and dig deeper, you'll see a lot and a lot, a lot of tools. And it's, you can compare it a bit like the JavaScript community. Every five seconds, there's a new framework. Well, that <laughs> obviously applies to the container uh, communities as well. Now, that container ecosystem, as I explained, is quite broad. But we can extrapolate it even more and call it the cloud-native landscape. Because as technology evolves, as the stacks that we use evolve, these tools are, are, are primarily invented to solve problems that are defined by the term cloud. And I've uh, deliberately put in uh, a slide with really, really, really small images just to show you the vast coverage of terms and technologies that we use when we talk about cloud. I do a lot of cloud presentations. And when I do cloud presentations, I talk about these things and not about the SaaS pass EAS fluff. That being said, hi, welcome. My name is Thais. I am Thais on Twitter, and that's a good place to find me afterwards, or to heckle me or banter me right now. I'm cool with that. It's OK. And I'm a technical evangelist at a web hosting company called Combo. We are a gold sponsor at the event, uh, thanks to the WordCamp crew. Well, you see a couple of familiar faces of the WordCamp crew for having us, uh, both as a speaker. There's three speakers of Combo here, Brecht, me, and Diana. Where's Diana? <laughs> so three speakers. We're very fortunate. I'm, uh, I'm a technical evangelist. I do a lot of speaking. I also do a, a lot of, I, I write. I'm a, I wrote this book, the Getting Started with Varnish Cash, uh, published by O'Reilly. So I'm not only passionate about containers and about cloud automation, but also about caching and reverse caching proxies. Now, why do we use the term containers? Now, this image should sketch it all. Because we want to contain software. That's one aspect. And because we want to ship software. So hence the, the metaphor. But imagine if we, if we go away from IT and from software and shipping software components and go into the realm of, of actual traditional shipment. And the city of Antwerp and the port of Antwerp is, is, is great for here. I think it's meant to be. And I'm here talking about container technology. Is imagine you have, imagine this boat is docked in, in China and we have a, a couple of hundred thousand iPhones that need to be shipped to Europe. And some of it is for this Apple store and others for an app, other Apple store. And, again, and this product, maybe there's some Samsungs that are shipped from Korea as well that are probably built in China too. <laughs> have to be go, go there and go there and go there. Do you drop them all in the bow of this boat and then figure it out when you get there? Probably not. You're going to contain it. You're going to have a component that is destined for this country and a little container that is built for another country. So you're compartmentalizing everything, all your little bits and pieces, on one big ship. So let's say that the ship is your server or your server platform. So you're containing it nicely. And this is the definition. The problem with putting text on slides is that people actually read the text. And I'm trying to avoid that now by just highlighting the things that matter. And what matters is that container technology is lightweight. It's not like a heavy VM that has a full-blown operating system and a full-blown hypervisor and a full-blown kernel. You don't really have these kinds of things. It's really light. And it's just, and I'm reading it literally here, an executable package of a piece of software that contains everything. 
And that's what matters. It contains everything. It contains your application code, your runtime, your libraries, your binaries, the full shebang. It's, it's all in there. And it's lightweight, and you can isolate your environments, and it's a very portable thing. You could say that it's a new approach to virtualization. Whereas virtualization has separate VMs and separate operating systems, this has a single Linux kernel, but with multiple isolated Linux systems. You can have, let's say, a Debian system on which you install Docker, and you can have an Alpine, or an Ubuntu, or a SUSE, or, or a CentOS. You can have all these systems. Because it uses, and I'm going to go into this because this is far beyond the scope of this presentation. But in fact, you can have, uh, you, it uses kernel namespaces, shrouting, so ownership and locking. Uh, unprivileged user, yada, yada, yada. Uh, let me show it graphically. I think that works far better. This is our traditional setup where you have your bare metal. I always find that a cool word, bare metal. I always do like bare metal. Uh, your bare metal infrastructure on which you put a hypervisor. It could be VMware, KVM, it could be Hyper-V, all these kinds of systems. And then you have your VM with a guest OS, with binaries, with libraries, with apps. And that comes out quite heavily. Whereas if you use Docker, which is kind of light, you just have your infrastructure, your bare metal, and uh, your host operating system, your Docker, and then you have all these tiny components that are easy to ship. And if you run them on your laptop, it just takes seconds to spin up a full-blown machine. Number one question, why would we use these kind of things? Why, as WordPress developers, should we care or not care? And the answer is, if you have lots of moving parts, it is fairly ideal. If you have lots of components in your stack that are tough to manage, if you have your server and there's tons of components there to manage, it makes sense to use it. And hence the very controversial slide I'm putting here. If you just want to host a single WordPress site, Docker is not for you. Okay. Bummer. Yeah, OK, that was it. That was it. Now, uh, yeah, all right. Uh, again, if this gets too technical or too boring, I will not get offended if you run away, because there's drinks here, there's tech here. Make your pick. But it, however, it is ideal for local development. So if you want to find a way to eliminate the vagrants of this world, or even worse, I like Vagrant, but Vagrant's quite heavy on your system. Tools like WAMP or MAMP. No, we're, we're among friends here, so who uses WAMP or MAMP? There is a way back. It's awesome. <laughs> it's awesome in a way, in a way. But Docker will help you a lot more because you're running Linux natively. You, you can tear it up. Uh, uh, spin it up, tear it down quite easily. You can have multiple versions without the slightest of overhead, full configurability. And it's, it's also great for continuous integration and continuous delivery. Let's say that you're in a CI, CD stream and you want to do automated testing and automated builds. You always want that machine, that disposable machine that you could boot up very quickly, do your build, do a set of tests, and then tear it down and it's done. Docker is ideal for that. And a uh, final reason why you should do it is because we can. Technology is there. And we're all developers or sysadmins or people from the broader IT community. If it's shiny and it's new, we probably like it, want to use it. And we find a way to justify it to management. OK, let's get down to brass tacks. Let's show it how it works. You start off with a Docker file in which you define in a sort of infrastructure as code style what your virtual machine, your container should look like. You build an image, you store it locally, and then you run the image. If you're in a more distributed setup, on the one hand, in the building stage, you can build an image that is just ready to run, that contains everything. And you push it to a registry, which is hosted in the cloud. You have the official Docker Hub, which is like the GitHub of Docker images. You just put it there, and other people could use it. Or it could be a private one that is protected. And then in the running stage, you pull it using Docker pull command, and you run it. So it's actually infrastructure as code style. Infrastructure as code meaning you have your regular application code, your PHP code, JavaScript, HTML code, which is very human readable and which makes sense. Well, setting up your infrastructure could be a similar thing. You have a, a descriptive language in which you define what your infrastructure should look like, and you commit it next to your code, and it's good to go. And we're going to do that today, and we're going to define a LAMP stack. Sorry for the cheesy pictures, but we're going to define a LAMP stack being Linux, Apache, MySQL, PHP, no surprises, right? And we're going to use a Docker file. We're going to create a Docker file ourselves. And I've, like most of this presentation is oversimplification of the facts. We only have X amount of minutes, so we have to make it count. So this is, I'm going to stand sideways so you can see it. This is the simplest of simple Docker files in which we install PHP and Apache. How do we do that? We need a base image. So the from specifies what we need, and we want a basic Debian operating system. And 
besides the colon, there's another term, stretch. That's the tag. So you can have an image and a tagged version. And the tagged version is stretch. Stretch, for those who are unaware, is Debian version 9. That's just a Linux system, a bare Linux system. And then we say the directory from which we want to work is far www.html. That's your basic Apache root where your PHP files are going to be. And then you're going to use the package manager of your operating system. If you use Debian or Ubuntu, that will be apt-get. So you'll do an update, and then you'll install Apache, PHP 7, and the bridge between the PHP process space and Apache. You merge that together. You run Apache on the foreground. You expose it on port 80, and you're good to go. And this is your image definition. This is your Docker file. And this is going to be hosted next to your, or put in the Git repository next to the rest of your code. That's just it. Now, one of the definitions, or one of the, the conventions, rather, of Docker is that a Docker container could only, by best practices, only runs a single service. So if you have PHP and Apache, that belongs together. Or if you have a Redis, you have MySQL, you have other systems, these are all separate containers. We're not going to mix them together. It's a sense of simplicity that a container only has a single task. And because they are so lightweight, we don't have to really be concerned about the impact of those on our system. So we're going to do docker build minus t, and then you give it a name. That's the name of our image called my WordPress. We use the dot to specify the current directory, and it builds. And when you're done, you can do docker images on your Linux, on your Windows computer, on your Mac, if you have the tool set installed. And you'll see that we created a my WordPress image that contains the, I'm going to show you what it contains. It contains a Debian stretch with Apache, with PHP, and when you boot it up, Apache will be running. The, excuse me, the, the MySQL component, the database, you don't worry about it, or is that just for simplicity's sake that you left out? Simplicity's sake? We'll get there. Okay. There, is a, there are slides, and then I'm going to call you out as soon as we're there, right? Okay. Hold tight. Uh, <laughs> yeah, because MySQL should need, should need to be hosted elsewhere. What you could do, what you could assume in, in, this, in this stage, is that you'll have an external connection string to a database system that is hosted elsewhere. Could be, could be the case. Not necessarily the case. And then you need to run it. Once you have your image, you need to run that image, you need to spin your infra up on your local computer. Think from the context of local development. Docker run, you give your container a name, we name it my WordPress, and the next thing we do is expose the port. In our definition of our Docker file, we had expose 80, that meant that the web server is exposing itself on port 80. What we're doing here is binding port 80 of our container to port 80 of our local machine. This is basically a port forwarding strategy that allows us, if we go to the browser and type localhost, we'll hit the Docker container. We will hit this very Docker container by doing 80 colon 80. Minus D allows us to detach it so that it's not in the foreground of our terminal, it's in the background. We can continue working. And then we do minus V to mount volumes. And that is essentially how we get our WordPress code that is hosted locally on our system and that we're modifying using our favorite editor or IDE, that we mount everything that is in the present working directory, PWD, go one level up, in my case, then go to the code folder where my code is hosted for this presentation, and mount that to var www.html. So if our WordPress code, our code base is in code, it will be attached to our Docker container and we're ready to run it in a lightweight fashion. And what do we use? We use my WordPress and the latest tag. I didn't specify latest anywhere. That's the automatic tag it gets when you don't tag a release. If you want to tag it, you can do Docker tag. You give it the source name, and then you provide a destination. What I've done here is I prefixed it with a username, my username on the Docker hub, Teisferin. And when I do Docker push Teisferin slash WordPress, it is going to, by default, get pushed to the public repository. And if I go there, you'll see it. This is my image, and I'm able to share it with you. So implicitly, it's already available there, and you can do docker pull tasferin slash WordPress, and you'll get that image. Now, don't try it, because I've already deleted this one. There's nothing really special about this. You'll just have an Apache. It's nothing really uh, worth using. But if you continue on this trend, on the fact that there's a public library of sometimes really reliable uh, images, why don't we just skip building it ourselves and just use the public images? Because we want PHP, right? Well, there's an official PHP channel. Here it is. It contains a whole bunch of versions. So what we do, does this thing have a laser pointer? Yes. PHP Apache. And we don't have to build it ourselves. We just rely on something that is maintained officially by the PHP community, and you have PHP, and we take the Apache tag, 
So that means that it's not PHP FPM. It's not have to, it doesn't have to be linked to Nginx. It's just PHP and Apache as I define myself but maintained by the community with a lot more features. But then, uh oh, <laughs> we all know this one, right? I forgot to install MySQL. And there are components to install MySQL. It's quite easy. But let's take it one step further. Let's go to the next level and just use the WordPress one. There's an official WordPress uh, Docker image that is ready to roll with tons of options. And it's quite good. So these are all the different kinds of versions of the Docker container, depending on the version of Docker, uh, the version of WordPress that you want, and depending on the version of PHP that you want, and the PHP implementation. So there's something for everyone. Do this in a very similar fashion. WordPress latest, I want the latest version of WordPress. And when you run it, you'll get this, the installation page. You notice that in the Docker run, I didn't put in a minus V, so I didn't mount my volumes. So it just installs, it downloads the latest version of WordPress, and it gives you the installation page. Ready to roll, install, boom, done. Yeah, because localhost is also, yeah, he, he's a clever guy. He said, look at the fav icon. Yes, that is the GitLab fav icon, because in a previous example, I ran a Docker container containing GitLab on my local host and stored the fav icon there. Very perceptive of you. So what we're going to do, we're going to change that and we're going to mount our own code. And then you have your own little WordPress code base nicely linked to it. And you do Docker PS and you see that there's a running Docker container containing port 80 that is mounted. And when you're sick and tired of it or when you're done in your day ends, you do Docker stop and then Docker RM and it's gone. And it's so simple and it's so lightweight. But then people ask the question, what about MySQL, right? What about MySQL? Well, uh, I'm a bit weary of running MySQL within containers because containers have this idea of, of, of the fact that it's quite disposable. You, you boot up a container and it can crash on you and then you reboot it and it's all fine and dandy. But MySQL and the data that is stored in MySQL is a bit more tricky. Now, there are ways to make it more durable, and there is an official MySQL container. And as you can see, it, the versions are a bit less. I'm going for the 5.7, and you could run it like that. Allow me to go through the different options so that it makes sense to you. We start up a Docker container, and it's MySQL tag 5.7, so the 5.7 version. And you see minus E. Minus E stands for environment variables. So we're passing along environment variables from our own system to the Docker container containing specific values. And these values will be used at the bootstrapping phase and will allow us, and it's no secret, let's, let's, let's give it a shot, MySQL root password. What will that do? Pop quiz. It will? It will? Come on, play along. It will? Set the root password, yes, thank you. And uh, MySQL database will create a custom database that we like, uh, followed by a user and its password. So what you're doing is instantiating the MySQL server from the run using simple environment variables. And then you're giving it a name and you're exposing 3306, which is the standard MySQL port, and you detach it. And then you do, for the sake of safety, attach a local data folder to var lib MySQL. So that means if your container dies, the data structures, the data files of your MySQL database server are still on your local computer. So as soon as you restart WordPress, all the or restart the MySQL container, all the data is still there. So from a local development perspective, if you've uh, set up a certain structure, it is still there. And you can have multiple versions of that. Maybe you have multiple projects. Well, I'm going to bootstrap another project and another project, and the data will be there. You can also make it a bit simpler. Uh, and have just dump files, and this is what I'm doing right here. I have a DB SQL folder, and it gets mounted on the container. This is just a convention to entry point in db.de, and that's a folder. And upon loading MySQL, that folder will be read. And if it sees an SQL file, it will load that SQL file. If it sees an SH file, a shell file, it will execute that shell file. So that's a great way to implement your database structure, or to load some seed data, or to run some scripts. So, so it shows your root password in your command history? Uh, yes, it does, but you can use secrets as well, Docker secrets. And that will read it from a file and bootstrap it that way. But I was just too lazy to do that. And I just wanted to show you the basics. And I picked a very, very basic password, so it's easy to guess. <laughs> no point hiding it. Uh, next question. So we did uh, the, the definition of our containers' images in an infrastructure's code style. 
So why not do the running of those services? Because a lot, this is not that convenient. Can, like if I show this to you 10 seconds, could you reiterate that from heart? Entirely? No. Yeah, you could, yeah, you could. But it's, it's kind of hard. So why not, don't we use another system? It's called Docker Compose. And it's yet another format, a file format in Docker Compose YAML that allows us to do all that in a single file. And that file could also be part of our code base and would allow us to set up both the MySQL and the web server all in one move. What you've seen in the Docker run commands is what is reflected here. Let me go over two services, a DB service, a WordPress service. An image name, an image name. Volumes, volumes. Environment variables that set all the passwords, it's all there in a single file. And then you just do docker compose up, minus D to detach to the background, and it's there. And you have your stack ready, single command. And you do logs, minus F to follow the logs. Then you see a bunch of logs that make total sense, right? <laughs> And if you care about the processes that run, you could do docker compose stop. And you see that there's a single MySQL process in the MySQL container. It probably uses threading for multiprocessing strategies or parallelism strategies. Whereas Apache uses process forking. You see user zero, that's probably the root user. It forks an Apache or it loads an Apache. And an Apache on another user has five child processes. So you're exactly seeing what happens. If you're done, do docker compose down and it all gets torn down. No questions asked. What if you want to add some extra services, like CLI and Redis? We've heard a lot about WordPress CLI. It's a convenient tool. I like it. Why not put it as part of the stack? And why not have a Redis there to do some object caching? You can define them there. And you, it's surprisingly easy. It's a two-liner. Redis, image Redis 4, done. You have Redis. CLI. Just a bit more dependencies and also a dependency on the file system. You want to make sure that your file system is right there, mount to var .html, so that it can read it, it can extract the database parameters, and you can go ahead and do some CLI stuff. Oh, another thing that is fairly important, entry point WP, because that's the name of the binary, right? WP, and then you can do WP plugin list. Well, if you specify that as your entry point, you don't have to mention it again when you run it. When we do this, docker compose run, Minus minus rm, so that it destroys it when the command got run. CLI, the name of our service, plugin list. And that runs that command. Let's say you have a Mac, it runs it on your Mac, but it runs it within the container. And that container has the, uh, the file system attached, so it can read all your WordPress files. It could do all the maintenance commands. And then you could just go ahead and say docker compose run, CLI, plugin, activate Redis cache. Boom, installed, done, on your local machine on a multi-VM setup. Try doing that in MAMP or WAMP. <laughs> Next up, continuous integration and continuous <coughs> delivery. It also makes sense. I've promised you that it makes sense there. Again, we're going to oversimplify the situation. And let's say you don't want to do an integration test. You've set up a WordPress. And at the end of the road, you want to make sure, as an assertion, that the title of your WordPress installation is Docker, just another WordPress site. I think there's a typo there, just another WordPress site. Apparently, there is a binary called pup that does sort of uh, inspection of your DOM layer. And by using this syntax, we can get the text of the title, and it should match. And then you just do a local host curl. So imagine in your WordPress image, in a testing situation, you just figure out what's on local host and make sure that the title of your WordPress is Docker, just another WordPress site. You don't want to be running that manually. You want to make sure whenever you, time you commit some new code, that test is run. This is, of course, oversimplification, but you get the point, right? You can do integration tests, and you can match the output and see what happens and make assertions there. And if that fails, if that test assertion fails, you stop the build. You don't do an automatic deploy. There's far better tools for it, like PHP unit to do unit testing and Codeception to do a mixture of unit testing and acceptance testing and functional testing or BHAT. You can also do deployment using a CI CD street. And the point I'm trying to make is that GitLab, I'm going to use this as an example, is a great example of Docker integration in CI CD systems. This is what it looks like. It's fairly familiar to, uh, to GitHub. It's a competing product of GitHub. With that difference is that the open source version can be hosted on premise. So if you want to have a local Git setup, you can use GitLab for that. And it has a CI CD pipeline in it. So if you deploy a specific file, if you put that in your Git repository and you push it to a Git remote that is hosted on that CI CD server, a set of tasks is going to get executed. A pipeline 
building, unit testing, integration testing, reviewing, deploying to staging, deploying to production. Now the point I'm trying to make is that GitLab uses the Docker syntax out of the box. This is the GitLab CI.yaml file, that definition file that defines your pipelines. And this sounds fairly familiar, right? Image, WordPress, latest. So what it does is for that run, as soon as you commit your code, for that run, it will bootstrap that Docker image, run it, perform all the tasks you want it to do, automated tests, build tasks, deployment tasks, and when you're done, it tears it down. And we can use similar services to, to do the automation here. Services, name, MySQL 5.7, sounds very familiar, right? We're gonna alias that to DB so that we can use that as our database host within our testing environment. All the environment variables that we need for authentication purposes. You've seen it twice now in Docker Compose, on the command line via Docker Run, you're seeing it here now in a CI CD platform. Do apt get install from some extra stuff like the MySQL client to import our SQL file, a Golang runtime so that we can get that pub binary. And then when all of that is done, we install or we run Apache. And then in the end, we do the actual testing. Test curl minus s localhost, do the pub of the title text, and it should be Docker, just another WordPress site. And when that fails, the build fails. When that succeeds, the build succeeds. And you can do, do some extra stuff like automatic deployment to staging, or do a, a click-based deployment, like a, a manual interaction to deploy to production. All of this using Docker logic. So the point I was trying to make is that when you do a git push origin master, and master then is your GitLab server, it will start these pipelines. You have a failed pipeline, uh, a pipeline that has succeeded, and then a pipeline that contains jobs that are currently running. And it will do all that in a Docker fashion. It will install all the packages you need, it will use that image, and then in the end, you'll have an integration test that is fully successful. It's just another example of how Docker makes sense from development to CI, CD. And then you do deployment as well. How do you, how do, you do deployment? Like, uh, what's, how's your way of deploying WordPress sites? Let's, let's, I see that you're all a little bit shy, oh, you're not shy. Envoyer, that's, that's a way of doing it, it's a good way of doing it. Does anyone use FTP? SFTP or FTP? Not my favorite protocol, not that secure. SFTP, however, uses SSH, it's a bit safer if you can use SFTP. Who uses SCP? Who uses rsync? I like rsync, it's easy. If not all the files have changed, not everything is transmitted sometimes, right? or you could use Git or whatever. Let's translate that traditional mindset to the wonderful world of Docker. Let's do it here. Docker run, this is the command that we use. How do we make that secure for deployment to the cloud? Let's say you have a, a cloud environment where there's Docker's containers running. Well, you can use custom images and a private registry. Let's go back to the idea of GitLab. GitLab also has a registry a private registry that is protected in which you can host Docker images, custom Docker images, that shouldn't necessarily be exposed to the outside world because we're afraid that it might contain sensitive stuff. So what you could do is, again, we have that little, our first example, we're gonna push that because it contains very sensitive data or not, it's up to you to decide, but this is the example. And what we're gonna do is Docker login and we're gonna log into a private repository. And that's, I've redacted domain, that's one of our domains, I've redacted that. And again, add a namespace for the, the namespace I have in my GitLab and the name of the project and build it there and push it there. And then I could just run it and it will connect on that port to our GitLab instance, we'll fetch that image. And that's the way you can deploy with Docker. But manually deploying Docker images and manually running Docker on a production system can be a very, very, very slippery slope. For example, containers, just like, that's the idea of, of, of these lightweight cloud instances as well that Amazon and Azure and Google advocates. It's, it could die on you every single second. It's like, don't assume these things are gonna run. That's a problem, right? If your Docker container crashes, what are you gonna do? Uh, install a supervisor process that just boots it up every single time? What if you have multiple services that all battle for the same ports? Or we have this WordPress installation, and because it's so light, we're gonna have a second WordPress. But wait a minute, both of them are bound to port 80. How are we gonna solve that problem? Or if you have so much services, where is everything hosted? What, how do you do service discovery? How do you do high availability when a Docker container should, if it dies on you, should become available or should immediately be ready on another system? 
Or what if you just have a single container, which is kind of useless? Why would you have one single container on a system? In those situations, you'll need orchestration. And the uh, default orchestrator up to recently from the Docker community itself was Docker Swarm. It's a way to orchestrate in the cloud. And you can test that locally. If you have Docker installed on your computer, you can use your Docker Compose file and orchestrate that locally in a Docker Swarm stack. Here's how you do that. Docker stack deploy, and you just specify that Docker Compose file that contained our WordPress installation, our database, and it will boot up the stack. And if you want to, you can check the services. And you have the database, and the Redis, and the WordPress. And this one is exposed on port 80. So you can go on your laptop. You do localhost, you'll have it. And you do uh, Docker LS uh, of the stack, and you see the stack with the number of services. And it goes on and on and on. You can remove your stack, your WordPress stack. Quite simple. But the thing is that Swarm is getting outcompeted by Kubernetes. Who has heard of Kubernetes before? Ranks super high on the hype scale. It's hype, hype, hype. Uh, and it's now also, it, I was at DockerCon last year in Copenhagen, and Docker is very much in its own ecosystem, want to do, wants to do things its own way, and it had to admit that it was so impressed by what happened in the Kubernetes world that the Docker tools in the, the next stable version of Docker will contain a built-in Kubernetes. Now, Kubernetes is an open source container orchestration project managed by Google. And it's going to be in there. Uh, if you install the Edge version of Docker, this is on my Mac, you go to that tab and you enable Kubernetes, you'll have a local Kubernetes on your system that will replace Docker Swarm. If you're planning to use Kubernetes in production, which is one of the strategies I would advise if you're planning to run Docker in production, you can do that. Docker stack deploy in a very similar way, but it won't be hosted on Swarm, but on a local Kubernetes installation. And, uh, this is more or less how it works. This is how Kubernetes works. I have to explain a couple of terms. And I see that we only have 10 minutes left, so let's keep it flowing. Uh, you have service definitions, and these service definitions is more of a networking way. It's a way to expose the ports that you need, like MySQL, like WordPress. We start at the, low, at the lower level with a container. By now, we're reaching the end of the presentation. You should know what a container is. Well, that container is, in Kubernetes, is hosted in a pod. And I know it's very specific terminology, and it took me a while to wrap my head around it. A pod is a collection of containers, and it also takes care of the high availability. So that means if you want to orchestrate multiple replicas of the container, it's all hosted in a single pod. Containers that are hosted in the same pod are in the same little local network. The other networking beyond, like this is a container in a pod, that's a separate pod. These have to use a sort of software-defined network to communicate with one another. We have volumes. and. That's something that is important as well. We did the binding of the volumes from our local disk on our computer to the container. While in production, you're not going to bind to your own laptop. That would be kind of risky, right? So what you do is you create a volume, a reliable volume. There's different kinds, uh, depending on the cloud vendor you work with. And you can have persistent volume claims that you can link it to it. And then all of this is exposed via services internally and exposed to the outside world via a concept we call ingress. And I know it's fairly complicated, and it's not the scope of this presentation to give you all the info about that, because it will A, bore you, and B, will be out of time and out of drinks by the time I finish that. So on my local laptop again, you saw me deploy the stack in the same way by using my Docker Compose file. I use a recent version, a sort of edge version, a beta version of Docker. So I already have Kubernetes. And this is the binary with which you manage Kubernetes. So you do kubectl, get deploy, and you're already seeing the deployments. So if you use the native way of using Kubernetes, you see that Docker, the Docker uh, tool set already created that for me. And then you can get PO. PO is short for pod. I don't know why they abbreviated that. I know. you could dive kubectl, get pods, and it will give you the pods. But if you do PO, you have to type two characters less. And it's very cool. And you see pods that only have a single node that are running. And you can get the services that were automatically defined in our Docker Compose file. Now, mind you, uh, entirely at the end of this presentation, I will show you the native uh, Kubernetes definitions. It will blow your mind in a way. I have to do that in the next five minutes, according to Wendy. Uh, so here you see all these kind of services and how they're exposed. And this one is exposed on our local computer to port 80. So we can just type localhost again and have the power of Kubernetes be accustomed to Kubernetes, because that's what we're going to run in production. And uh, we're going to do We're going to write our own deployment. This is what Docker Compose, the, the, the translation stage from local Docker Compose to a full-blown Kubernetes system did for us. But when we want to go to productions, we have to write these files ourselves. So let's start with the MySQL part. 
Are you ready? Yes? Let's do it. This is our service definition. All of this, all these chip snippets of files and code will be hosted, in my case, in a single file, single deployment file. We're going to run that, and it will do rolling deployments to the cloud. So what we're doing here is answering some, we're setting some metadata. But what we're primarily doing is saying we want to expose the port 3306 for an app that is called WordPress. And then we're doing some persistent volume claims. Don't look at the details. The idea is that we're claiming one gigabyte of storage from our system, from our cluster, because it's a clustered system. Uh, at the minimum, six nodes, three master nodes, three worker nodes, or minion nodes, as they call it. And uh, then we have our deployment, our MySQL deployment. Contains similar strategies. I know, it's a lot of YAML. And that's my main concern here, lots of YAML. What we're doing here is we're naming things. We're naming it MySQL WordPress. We're using that 5.7 image. And it goes on, right? The environment variables, you see them? What we're doing here, and that's what I wanted to point out to you, is using secrets here. We have a secret that is registered in our cluster that is encrypted and where the passwords reside. So we have separate ways of doing that. So I have all these environment variables, and we link farlib MySQL so to make sure that it's attached to that persistent volume claim. If that container dies and gets booted up again, because that's what the container orchestrator will do. If something dies, it will reschedule it automatically. And you can have replicas so that you have multiple versions of this. And it all will get bound to varlib MySQL. In that way, you have safety about the storage of your data, because that matters. And then WordPress, again, similar. Service, which service, port 80. We're going to do type load balancers so that it's load balanced across the cluster if we have multiple replicas. We'll have a, a one gigabyte storage in this case. We're going to have the very similar things. We're going to host the latest version of WordPress, have some metadata here, have all these parameters here so that it's bound, use the storage, yada, yada, yada. <coughs> what I'm doing here, again, I'm sorry, I'm going to put it in my command line history. I'm going to register those secrets. You can read them from a file again. It will be stored nicely and securely within the cluster. And then uh, we're going to do cube. C and this is the magic. This is where it happens. kubectl apply minus f, that entire file with that huge YAML definition. And it will automatically orchestrate it in the cloud. And it will load balance it. <coughs> and you can have replicas and all that you want. And you can check the pods, and the pods are there. They're first at first, they're not ready for they're creating the containers. Then they're running, you're up and running. And you can run all that stuff. And you can get the services, and the services are there, and you're good to go. And you can get the deployments then, and you can say, we're going to scale, we add two replicas so that it's load balanced on the fly. Again, it will run it, and there will be a desired state of two. So uh, I'm not going to go in all those details. But what I would advise you, if you want to really, really feel the power of Kubernetes locally on your system, is to install Minikube. And Minikube, as it says, is a miniature version of Kubernetes that only contains a single instance hosted in its own little virtual machine. I think primarily on your Mac. Uh, maybe you can have it on Windows as well. I'm not sure. And then you can do these kinds of things. The service that is defined on port 80. Well, then you can do minikube service minus minus URL WordPress, and it'll get the URL you could run. You don't have to care about all the networking stuff, because that cluster IP kind of thing that is hosted within the EVM, you can't really touch that. Because again, this is all Linux, and your MacBook and your Windows, that is not Linux. So there's a little virtual machine in place to make that happen. And when, you wanna, when you're too lazy to copy and paste that URL, you can just do minikube service WordPress, your browser will open, and you'll see the service. That's a way of abstracting it. When you go into the cloud, it all depends on your vendor uh, and the company you work with, how it's going to get exposed to the outside world via HTTP or what have you. And then if you're curious about what runs on Kubernetes, you can type minikube dashboard, and it will open the Kubernetes dashboard. And you can see all the bells and whistles. And when you're ready for production, when you want to go to deployment, I have two minutes left. Maybe that's one by now. Uh, and we're getting there. We're, we're reaching the end. We only have six more slides. You can do kubectl, config, use, context, and you can switch to a production context. So you, you'll have multiple contexts. You'll have a development and maybe a staging and a production and an acceptance. Or you have something at Google, something at Combell, something at Amazon. You can switch. And then just apply that same configuration file that by now you don't want to look at anymore. You just built it. It's there. And it's done. And believe me, there's more. There's a lot more. It's a lot more. But that's, that's a story for another day. I just wanted to dive you, like take you and dive right in into the wonderful world of WordPress and Docker. I understand and I accept that it's quite hardcore, quite technical. But I do believe that it's a wave that is passing by right now. And 
might as well want to ride it. Take your surfboard, ride that wave, because the future is definitely going to be containers. I'm not sure if Docker will be the technology that will be out there in the next 10 or 20 years, but containers is definitely something you have to look at. That being said, you can find these slides will be published on frin.eu later on. You'll see a list of my past and upcoming talks. So if you want to see more of that stuff, follow me there. And I'm on Twitter, Instagram, you name it. Uh, I want to thank you because we've reached the end and you haven't fallen asleep, most of you, I guess. And there's drinks outside. And, but unfortunately, WordCamp Antwerp is done. So thank you for sticking around. See you next time. Thank you for hanging out with me.